If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I'm Taylor. I'm the next gen director here at Grace, uh, which means that I get the awesome privilege of overseeing our children's and our students' ministries. And uh, I am really excited to get to share with you all this morning. I don't know if you know this, but this is a, a Sunday that's actually a little bit infamous in the pastoral world. It's one that I affectionately like to call Backup Preacher Sunday. <laughs> and that's because every pastor wants to take this Sunday off, you know, that Sunday between Christmas and Easter. And so you get a lot of Christmas and Easter, Christmas and New Year's. It's a long vacation. No, every, every pastor wants to take off that Sunday between Christmas and New Year's. And so you get a lot of youth pastors, you get a lot of associate pastors preaching today. I actually, I had this pop up in my social media feed this week um, from a Twitter account that's Church Curmudgeon. It says, I for one am glad that the youth pastor is preaching this Sunday. I don't understand his haircut, his pants, or his point, but he's done preaching in 23 minutes. <laughs> and while I'm not going to promise that I'll be done in 23 minutes, I'll do my best to, uh, to represent our pulpit well. And as I, was, as I was getting ready for this, this morning and as I was thinking through some of the reasons that this, this is a great vacation Sunday, I actually started rethinking about some of the ways that this is really an influential and important Sunday to get to share. And it's, it's really those same reasons. You know, maybe more so than any other week of the year, this week our life schedule is just flipped upside down. You know, our, our routines are very different in that week between Christmas and New Year's because work has a different rhythm and family and friends do as well. And we're still in this, this kind of holy Christmas season where we're asking questions about our life and our purpose and about God that maybe we don't ask the rest of the year. And in my life, I've found there's really no better time than when we're out of rhythm, when our life is kind of upside down for God to reach out to us and to speak to us and for us to get a chance to respond and, and get out of some of our ruts. And for better or for worse, our lives are upside down this week. And I don't think there's any better time for us to wrap up our series on the upside down of Christmas. And I'll be honest, as I, uh, I don't usually think of our passage that we have this morning of Simeon and Anna at the temple. I don't really think of it as a Christmas story. In fact, I'd even say the very first time I ever thought of it as a Christmas story was several weeks ago when Marnie came up to me and said, hey, we're doing a Christmas series, and hey, here's your passage. You know, because when I think of the Christmas story, I think of all the incredible stuff that we witnessed on Tuesday. You know, the wise men that we talked about, and then we saw them come, come to life in our live nativity in that family service. I think of, you know, the angels and the shepherds and the star and all those awesome animals. And can we take a second and appreciate that alpaca? Look at that guy. Yes. The alpaca deserves our applause. That is, I need an alpaca in my life. That thing is so cute. But those are the kind of things that I think of when I think of the Christmas story. I think of that classic nativity. You know, all those, those characters and images that we have there. Something I don't think about as much would be Jewish temple rituals in Simeon and Anna. You know, this passage in a lot of ways seems more like kind of a side note between this miraculous story of the birth of Jesus and then the stories that follow about his life and his death and resurrection. But after I got to spend some time in it, got to study it, got to let, let the Spirit just kind of talk to me, changed my mind. This, this passage is Christmas. In fact, it's so Christmas that what I proposed this morning is that we actually update our classic nativity to represent this story as well. So we're going to take our classic nativity with its usual cast. So we have the barn. It'll come up. There we go. We have the barn. We have Jesus. We've got Mary and we've got Joseph. We've got, got that star, of course. The shepherds. The wise men. Then, of course, the angels. And, you know, this is, this is an awesome nativity. This is a wonderful nativity because... Every single character in it has so much meaning, and they, they each tell us a little bit more about this incredible story of Christmas. But I think there's, there's still more to tell. And there may not have been room at the end. There's a little bit of room in the barn still. So today I'm going to talk about a few additions that I have for it. And I think this is also the perfect week for us to talk about updating our nativities, because this is the week that 
all of our Christmas decor is on clearance. So, you know, if you're a bargain hunter, if you're a little bit creative, you stick with me. I think I've got some great additions for your nativity for this next year. So let's, let's start by reading our passage today, getting familiar with it again, or maybe even for the first time. So I'm going to read it for us. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. And when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Okay, now we're familiar with it again. I think I know what you might be thinking. Obviously, the nativity doesn't cover this passage because the story doesn't take place in the barn. I thought about that, and I don't think that that makes it not nativity worthy. Because you see, the wise men, they weren't at the barn either. In fact, if we look at Matthew, we see that the wise men came and saw Mary and Joseph and Jesus in Bethlehem, but in a house, not at the barn. That's because these wise men came at a later time in the story. Jesus and the family had found a more suitable living space by then. And the wise men had a long ways to travel in order to get to Bethlehem, and they got there when Jesus was older. And we know that because of the words that they use for Jesus or child, as opposed to, you know, baby, your infant or newborn, which would have been very clear in the Greek. And also that decree that Herod gives when he's trying to get rid of Jesus, he decrees that all children under two should be killed in Bethlehem. So we know that Jesus is probably somewhere between the age of one and two when the wise men come to visit. So actually, our story takes place kind of in the middle of our traditional traditional Christmas stories, you know, between the, the shepherds coming and visiting the family and the wise men coming. So timeline-wise, Joseph and Mary have just been visited by the shepherds, but they're not even aware of the wise men yet. They haven't received, you know, those, those valuable presents from the wise men. And they're not even aware of King Herod's coming plan and animosity towards Jesus little background here. Mary and Joseph and, Ju- and Jesus were all Jewish. Hopefully no surprises there. And because of that, there are a bunch of rituals they're required to do. The first one that we see at the very beginning of this passage is the circumcision of Jesus. And that would mark the covenant between God and the people of Israel. And that would have to happen on the eighth day. And that's also when Jesus would officially be named. So we have that that ritual, and then we actually fast forward about a month in the story, 32 days, and that family's back at the temple for two more rituals. So they would have had to give a sacrifice offering that would be uh, a sacrifice that's offering Jesus in service to God as their firstborn son, and then they would do a sacrifice of cleansing for Joseph and Mary, which traditionally would have been needed after bringing a sinful human being into the world. Which these rituals lead us to the first thing I want to add to our nativity. That's that I think Mary and Joseph need to look more realistic. Because there's, there's something, as I was going through this passage, that there was a truth that it made stand out to me so much more clearly than I've ever really seen before. And that's that Mary and Joseph were really poor. 
Again, some blank faces, not a lot of reaction. I don't think you're grasping it. I mean, if you're anything like me, I'd never really taken the time and just pondered the reality that Mary and Joseph were really poor. I always just looked at this Christmas story and thought, yeah, you know, Bethlehem was crowded. Mary and Joseph, you know, they didn't have the, the means to, to buy their way into a hotel room. That's just relatable. I don't know about you guys, but I've never been able to go to, you know, a popular city, popular destination during a popular tourist time when all those hotels are booked and just go in there and kind of flash some cash and make the hotel room become vacant. It's just not my life. And that's kind of how I always pictured Mary and Joseph, the hundreds of times that I heard that story. You know, I thought of them as being poor in the sense that they weren't rich, they weren't wealthy, they weren't kings. You know, they were maybe middle class or lower middle class or maybe lower class. But that's, that's not exactly what God wants to say here. And if that, that is what he wanted to say, that in itself, that's a huge deal. You know, that's a big incarnational leap that the God of the universe would come down to be middle class. But Luke wants to point out even more here. He wants to point out that they were very poor. You know, the kind of poor that often gets looked down in society, both then and now. You see, the sacrifice that they made, and this is something that Luke's audience would have kind of noticed right away, it was two pigeons or two turtle doves. It was two birds. The sacrifice they were supposed to make was a bird and a lamb. And that substitution of a second bird instead of the lamb, that's, a, uh, that's an allowance that's made for the really poor. It's a sacrificial scholarship or temple welfare, if you will. That's because a lamb was a little bit costly, where birds, on the other hand, were just mere pennies on the street. And Luke, you know, he intentionally put that in there because it's a huge statement that the God of the universe became man in a house, in a family of poverty. You know, that poverty is not something that's dishonorable. In a world where the, the poor get demonized, where a lot of times they're blamed for their sinful actions leading to their poverty, and where today roughly 36% of the world lives in poverty, God becoming poor means that poverty is not dishonoring. It has nothing to do with your eternal worth. Because if God himself can be poor, it can't. You know, Jesus becoming manifest in poverty means that wherever you are financially, wherever I am financially, whenever any of us are financially, we're adequate in the eyes of God because our finances are not our worth. And God came to save the poor. But God didn't stop there, and Luke doesn't want us to miss that because Luke makes it really clear in this story and in his whole gospel that God came to save everyone. You know, the name of, of Jesus that Luke kind of just puts in these rituals there, and that naming ceremony, that, that would have said a lot to people because it's, it's the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua, which middle school me thought was hilarious that Jesus' name was Joshua. But it's this Greek Gentile language of the Hebrew name Joshua. And what it means is Yahweh is salvation. So Yahweh the God of Israel is salvation, but in a Gentile language. And then a few verses later, Simeon points out that Jesus would come to save the Gentiles and all Israel. Interesting uh, choice of words there. And then right here, I want to actually turn our focus to the wise men in our nativity, which I know isn't an actual addition. I'm not trying to shortchange you. But I think it's really important that we, we bring a new focus on the wise men right now because God's telling us something through them. And the wise men, they're a bit of an unknown. We don't know exactly who they are, what their names were, where they came from. But a lot of scholars think that it's pretty likely they came from Babylon. And if, if they didn't come from Babylon, then their craft is magi. Their, their, reading of the store, their reading of the stars, the Zoroastrianism, is something that was perfected and would have come from Babylon. It would have been deeply connected to Babylon. It's like if I told somebody that I run a cheesesteak shop, you know, even if I'm in Atlanta, they're going to automatically connect me to Philly. And the Magi, similarly, were connected to Babylon. And if you, you know, if you remember your 
Old Testament history, your Jewish history, Babylon and Israel weren't friends. You know, Babylon conquered Israel. Babylon destroyed the temple that was the, the center of worship in Jewish life. And Babylon also took families and individuals and literally moved them throughout the East without their will. When we see these wise men, we're not just seeing, you know, Jewish kings bowing to Jesus or just Gentiles that are bowing to Jesus. We see Gentiles who are representatives of former enemies that literally ripped the nation of Israel apart. And yet these are the men that God divinely revealed the Messiah Jesus was going to be born and that, who then sought him and worshiped him. One thing that God makes clear in his incarnation, in his life, and even through his death is always that he's come so that everyone can have salvation. God came to save everyone. When we look at the nativity, Mary and Joseph and the wise men should remind us of that. And in his story, Luke goes on to introduce us to two new characters. And we actually only see them in his gospel. And I think these two are definitely nativity worthy as additions. And that's Simeon and Anna. Yeah. Oh, Anna's shy, but she'll come. There we go. And, you know, one of the main criteria that I can see to be a character in the Christmas story is that, that God reveals Jesus to you, that you, you witness the baby Jesus, and then you proclaim the baby Jesus as the Messiah. The shepherds and the wise men, they both they follow this formula and their foundational pieces of the nativity. And Simeon and Anna are no different. Luke tells us a lot about them. You know, Simeon's a man who's righteous and who the Holy Spirit is with. God even told Simeon that he wouldn't die before he saw the Messiah with his own eyes. And then leads Simeon to the temple on the day that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus are there. So we know that Simeon is righteous. We see that. And we also know and see the fruits that he's guided by God. And similarly, Anna is one that's regarded as a prophetess, which there weren't many prophets in Israel at this time, let alone prophetesses. Prophetesses, prophetess. But so we know that her righteousness is there. It's shown in that title. But then also, she goes to the temple whenever possible. So we see the fruit of her faith. We have these two great witnesses to Jesus, but they actually have even more going for them in this time because tradition regards both of them as elderly. And their age would have been important because it would have elevated their words to a whole new level. You know, the elderly were regarded with higher respect and with higher levels of wisdom as it should be. And so here we see these two righteous and respected witnesses that are at the temple at the same time as Mary and Joseph and Jesus, which is pretty remarkable. Because before we even get into what happens at the temple, let's take a minute and just appreciate all that God put in place for them to meet there in the first place. Because just like the shepherds or the wise men, it really took an act of God to make that happen. You know, first it took, took the laws that were put in place by God hundreds and hundreds of years before that he, he put in place, you know, with that idea of, okay, this is part of the plan. And then it took the nation of Israel with some, some prompting and some guidance, maintaining and practicing those years, for, those laws for hundreds of years, which then culminates in God becoming man and in Jesus as the incarnate God fulfilling these laws which in itself is fascinating because he didn't need to. You know, Jesus didn't need to be circumcised to show the covenant between God and man because he was God. He didn't need you know, to be offered in service of God because he was God. And Joseph and Mary didn't need to be cleansed for bringing a sinful human into the world because they didn't bring a sinful human into the world. But these were done so that the righteousness of the family and the righteousness of Jesus could never be in question. And so we, it could be said that Jesus went through all that man would have had to go through. So God put these laws in place, and then hundreds of years later, he's using these laws of old as part of his method to fulfill the new. And on top of that, we have the, the divine intervention and revelations that take place. We see that Simeon's clearly shown to the temple 
and led there by God to appear at just the right time. And then he's divinely filled with this truth to speak about Jesus's life. You know, these fingerprints of God are all over writing this story. And that's not to mention the rest of the Christmas story, you know, where God summoned the shepherds through divine revelation of an army of angels and through that star. And Jesus's family was, you know, was brought to Bethlehem by an unusual uh, census, which was done to fulfill prophecy, which is what also happened to lead the wise men later to Jesus, where that Jesus was saved from death in a divinely inspired dream, which also, by the way, ended up leading him and his family to Egypt, which fulfilled prophecy, as well as creating this deep poetic twist that the God of Israel that was best known at this time for leading his people up out of Egypt would then become man and as the embodiment of salvation come out of Egypt. I mean, it's, it's all just so beautiful and poetic and obviously ordained by God. And all that is just a tiny, minute example of really the, the cosmic and incomprehensible ways that God's in control. No, no part of this story is an accident. God is in control. And he's in control now just as clearly as he was then. And I'm sure that some of us in this room right now need to hear that because in life it's so easy for, for sin and, and just the daily grind to make us feel like this world is chaotic and that we're alone. But God's in control. And he's leading us to his victory. God wins and that's not in doubt. And when we look at Simeon and Anna and that nativity, it reminds us that God's in control. And that brings me to the last addition that I want to make to the nativity. And this one's my favorite. I'm a guy. I think Jesus needs a sword. And there's a couple reasons why I think Jesus needs a sword. And they both have to do with the, the words that are spoken over him at the temple. In the first part of Simeon and Anna's testimonies, they testify that, that Jesus is going to be the one who saves the world. You know, Simeon says, my eyes have seen your salvation. And Anna says that she's seen the redemption of Israel. And at this point in the story, these are the words we expect. This is what we've gotten used to, to hearing about the Messiah. You know, Jesus, the Messiah, is the Savior. He's the hope of the coming victory of God for redemption and salvation. This is, this is where we're at at this part of the story. And I think that this, this part of the story is actually really relatable to our culture, and to things that we do um, often, actually. Specifically, something we do in the sports world. And, and that's these professional sports drafts that we have in basketball and football. Because really, as, as soon as the season ends, and sometimes even before it, the whole sports world shifts, and everybody starts fixating and salivating over these high school and college prospects. They're going to come up into the pros in the next year. And I'm, I'm a big sports fan, but the, the narrative that surrounds these kids is crazy. Like we talk about them as these, these messianic hopes, that they're going to be the restoration of a team or a franchise. And specifically, the word savior is used a lot. And there's, there's one team in the NFL specifically that I think is, is kind of constantly looking for a savior. If we have any Jets fans, I feel like they're tensing up, but <laughs> it's all right, you're safe. It's the Cleveland Browns. And the, the Browns have, if you're not familiar, have gone through just a ridiculous amount of quarterbacks in the last 20 years trying to find their hope and their savior. And it, it got so bad at one point that actually there was a, a picture that went viral a couple of years ago. And it was of a fan's jersey. And they'd gotten tired of buying a new jersey every time that the team got a new quarterback every month. And so instead of, instead of buying a new jersey, they started crossing it out and writing it. And they, they ended up with this. And what's even sadder is this is actually two or three years old. Because there's some names to add to that list. And as I was looking for this, I, I even found this shirt that's called the Baker Mayfield Savior shirt. And if you look at it, it's kind of hard to see, but inside that six, that's made up by all the names of those quarterbacks that were their hope and that then failed. And they make up the jersey number of, of their current Savior hope, which is Baker Mayfield, who unfortunately is not having a great season this year. 
And more often than not, in this world when we long for a savior, this is what we run into. It's disappointment and despair. I mean, I, I honestly think that the nation of Israel and Browns fans would have a lot to relate to in their, in their desperate hope for a savior. But because of Christmas time, and now throughout the year, we have a hope of a savior who's realized, a savior that we know has victory. And that sword that Jesus has, that symbolizes the power that, that God has that we know that he wins. But it symbolizes a lot more than that. Because the reality of how God wins, that's what throws everything upside down. Simeon goes on to say that Jesus would cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and a sword would pierce Mary's soul as well. The Savior wasn't going to be what people had expected. You know, Israel expected a great king, a military power, a high priest, even a prophet. Someone who would lift Israel up and bring them to victory. But no, God became man and then he revolutionized what the kingdom even was. He preached and, and brought the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of Israel. And through his life and through his death, he guarantee us salvation and life to the full if we would give our everything and follow him. That's upside down. You know, the prophecy of Simeon here is, is where the narrative of Jesus begins to change. From Jesus with a sword like a great military king to Jesus carrying a sword that's reminiscent of what we see in Hebrews 4.12. You know, a sword that can pierce the division of soul and spirit discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, a sword that causes the falling and rising of many in Israel unto this day. Because that's the, that's the sword that cuts to the heart of the choice that we have to make to follow Jesus fully. Because we have to follow Jesus for true life. You know, the Jesus of the nativity is the same one that we have to choose to follow fully with everything that we have. But when we do, we know that we have victory, we know that we have salvation, and we have abundant life. Would you all pray with me? Father God, thank you for what you've done so many years ago at Christmas. And thank you for what that means, that we, for some crazy reason, are part of the family that you've decided to adopt, that we can be part of your victory we can find salvation, and we can find life and find it to the full. God, I pray that in this season when everything is a little bit different than usual, God, I pray that you would help us to see you, help us to respond to you. Amen.